Welcome to Alfheim and God of War Ragnarok with a therapist part seven. Great to have you here, YouTube. I appreciate so much that you continue to take time out of your life, let alone your day or week or night or whatever to watch this playthrough. It means a lot to me that you have made it this far. I am grateful for all the engagement on all the prior videos and the likes and all that fun stuff. So please make sure that you follow the links down in the description if you haven't already. If you love me enough to get to part seven, like, come on, get more of me in your life. Get, get, get me on your TikTok. Get me on your Insta. Get me on your Twitter. You know, get me on your Twitch. Come hang out with us on Twitch sometime. You'll notice there's daylight sometimes. I'm trying to be cool and not just stream at terrible hours. So come hang out with us sometime. We'd love to have you here. Regardless, please leave a thumb up on the stream. Engage uh, to your heart's desire and share this with anybody who you think could benefit from it. I'm very excited to see what Alfheim has in store for us today. So let's rock and roll. Mm. Screw your baskets. I'm not sure where the temple is from here, but that's where we'll find Groa Shrine. Okay, well, let's take a gander at this. Broken history. Aye, not exactly an easy fix for that. Indeed. Graffiti in Dark Elf territory next to a statue of their ancestors, the elves before the division of light and dark. The message being what exactly and for who? Either the elves have seen this statue and ignored it, or they're more concerned with mastery over the light. Instead of bugs, there's rats here. What a great way to start off with hiccups. All right, Tyr. See the elves continue their war. Yeah, so much for things being better in Alpha. Right, there's a chest down there. Atreus be like, how do you always find that? Thimble winter hit Alfheim hard. No. Storms have plagued Alfheim's deserts long before Fimble winter. Living dares up. Huh. It was once full of life, you know. The jewel of Alfheim is our most sacred and fertile desert, teeming with an unequal diversity of life, from the majestic Havgufa and their dulcet song of the sands to a wide array of turtles and lizards found in the Hjarta, and the abundant herds of gazelle and ibex roaming the shifting dunes. All creatures of the desert are given breath by the grace of the light. Take a moment to witness the grandeur and reflect. Keep well thy realm. Oh man, the war of dark Music. elves and light elves. The song of the sands, they called it. Gone now. Another victim of war. Okay. Damn, Tear. What a boss. I think I see something. Hold on. I hear something out there. Something big. It's in pain. Ooh. Okay. Can I get this sword? I want this sword. Damn. Oh, shit. Okay. Well. This isn't great. Tear, what do you think, bud? Mimir, anybody want to weigh in? 
Our goal is at the temple, not in the desert. There, the Temple of Light. Gora's shrine is at the top. Yeah, but I gotta go break some pots. Or light some. Ba bam. Boom. Where's the other one? Oh, this one was easy. Is everything okay? Hi, old friend. Just looting on your chest. We'll be right along. <laughs> My dad likes loot. Ah, very well. <laughs> One of three. Okay. My dad likes loot. Sure do. Come on. How could you not like loot? All right. Damn. These like guys just like stab these guys in the heart and just leave it? They're pretty metal. Prayer never bothered. Turning to Alfheim, did he, Mimir? I no. I assumed the fate of his own realm took precedence. Wait, Freya's brother? Yes. Cut from a different cloth, that one. Kind of cloth? We talking like cashmere? We talking cotton? We talking suede? We talking silk? What are we talking? <laughs> Atreus, we get it. You fancy. Oh boy. There's a barricade up ahead. What are those shiny rocks? Twilight stone. A rare material that can take millennia to form. Majestic, isn't it? Occasionally, the light of Alfheim will bind to a rock and crystallize, growing like moss on a fallen tree. Truly a wonder of the Nine Realms. cool actually I agree but yeah. come on that There's hole's big enough to shoot over. in here yeah I see it Atreus wait is it what okay wow all right well that's gonna oh. make this interesting I didn't know it could do that Posting about the last game is fine. Last game already happened. I, I don't care really if people talk too much about it as long as chat doesn't get consumed by it. My assumption Greatest is that if people brother. are watching this, they've seen it. How was he involved? Long ago, Fear of the Vanir traveled to Alfheim, where he discovered a once beautiful land devastated by war. Using his divine powers, he set about cultivating a tenuous peace among the elves. Tenuous peace. Bit of an oxymoron. Find you, incoming. Hey, Dick. Light runic attack, a tracking axe throw that ricochets between targets marking marked by pressing R1 repeatedly. Not interested. Lumia, do you understand these poems? 
Oh, there's always meaning if you look hard enough, brother. It's all in what you bring to it. Kvasi, your work of brilliance that, if misunderstood, proves the ignorance of the reader. Stick, rope, tar, black, skin, handprint, baby crying, shower stink, death beach, grubs delicious, bomb piss. Well, if that ain't Death Stranding, I don't know what it is. By the way, you can catch my playthrough of Death Stranding on YouTube. Kratos Drake, at your service. Did you mention how that piece fell apart as soon as he left? I was getting to it. You hear that? Oh, no. Oh, no, what? Oh, no, what? That's enough, please. You don't need to do this. Brother, we don't want to hurt you. We do not have a choice. You do, but I don't really want to choose death, so. Oh, shit. We're the ones who freed the light. Why are you fighting us? We helped you last time. Atreus, focus. I hate Alpha. <laughs> Me too, my guy. Most unfortunate. They attacked us. More will follow once we're inside. Is there truly no other way? Not like they're giving us much of a choice. So your father said. I'm just naive, I suppose. No. Just an optimist, old friend. <laughs> well, doubts can be one and the same. They don't have to be separate. Hmm. Another poem? Tribute to Freya, made by the elves. He must have left it here when he raced back to Vanaheim. What is this? A charm to ward off nightmares. This charm is meant to absorb nightmares. The principle behind such magic is not a local one, but a theory picked up by Tyr from the Western lands. The premise is a simple one. Nightmares seek us out in the dark, hoping to crawl into our minds and corrupt them from within. Charms such as this are meant to distract and trap the nightmares, tangling them up in the charm's threads until sunrise can incinerate the devious bastard. In this case, the elves. Well, knowing the elves, there are probably more tributes to find. All right, well, now. It appears that I can't do anything yet. So, I will not waste my time. Because I'm guessing... That there's no way that I can do this. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. It's so tall. We came in from the top last time. Didn't realize all this was even down here. It's an older gate built to promote cooperation between the elves, but it looks like it's been sealed for some time. How do we enter? Grab that wheel and I'll show you. Brute force, huh? I'm bothered that I can't go into that spot.
I'll go first. Atreus, let me know when I've reached halfway. So, uh, what's happening right now? This seal is meant to represent the balance of the realm when Freya was here. Light and dark, working together in harmony. How's that look, Atreus? Good, I think. Father, now you go. Unfortunately for Alfheim, Freyr couldn't accept his sister's decision to marry Odin. He returned to Vanaheim and left this realm to its fate. To be fair, the Aesir did set him on fire that one time. Hmm. The door should have opened. Are you sure it's balanced? Yeah, but the realm isn't. Not anymore. Father, try pulling it the other way. Yeah, yeah, and here. You keep pushing forward. Uh-oh. Fine work, Atreus. Shall we? Nice deduction, my guy. What's a Dark Elf statue doing in the Light Temple? That's just how they looked before the Division. The Division? Yes. The Elves weren't always split between Light and Dark, you know. This statue depicts the Elves before the war, before they discovered the power of the Light. Hmm. Imagine how humid this room would be when you walked into it. You're like out in the cold Thimble Winter, and then you walk in here, and it's just like muggy. And moist. It smells like pollen. Solid light. Guess some things don't change. Sure don't. Above the door, there's a light crystal. I know, Atreus. Holy crap. Let me just look. Here, they usually work. Really, do I have to chuck this off of this? Yes, I see now. The Twilight Stone briefly imparts a bit of light to your axe. That's useful. Green. What's that sound? No sense in spoiling the surprise. I've never seen the Lake of Souls so volatile. Aye. Fimple Winter, you reckon? Of course. Making the light unstable. So the base of this light well, that's the Lake of Souls. Yes. After the creation of the Nine Realms, fallen souls began to gather down in those waters. When the elves discovered its potential, they built this temple to harness that energy. A smashing success, to say the least. Many of them became addicted to their newfound power. And thus, the Light Elves were born. Interesting. Uh, flashing light warning, I suppose, while we're in this area. Reminds me so much of the Dreaming City from Destiny. Thank God these are conveniently placed to where I can chuck them at these crystals. Well done. Though I imagine our light elf friends would be less than pleased. Hmm, so the light elves are drunk with power. Speaking of Light Elves, let me try talking to them again. They Thanks may just to let these two do their thing, brother. Oh, shit! Ah! Ah! 
on light bridges, but now the bridges are gone. I have an idea to get us across. <sighs> Lucky for us, swearing off violence doesn't mean he can't disfigure some architecture. This way, the shrine awaits. <laughs> yes, property damage, totally within the purview of my man tier. No problem. <laughs> love that they're breaking the fourth wall on this because it's true like it's so self-aware it's like if you were if this was real life like if i was tearing a trance i'd be like what come on man jesus like we know where we're going and kratos is just like nah man I'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna go get some stuff out of these chests it's just great like the temple looks so different than i remember one of the things, this is just a shout out to Sony Santa Monica on this because it's something that I think they do better than probably anybody else that I've ever seen in games is they build into the game an awareness of the fact that it's a game without breaking the immersion. So like, for example, having Mimir attached to your ass and he says behind you, prevents them from having to have some sort of like marker necessarily on even though i know that there's a marker sometimes but like hearing him say behind you makes sense and so it makes it so that you're more adept in combat without you having to rely on some sort of like lazy mechanic the fact that like there's an awareness around how like when you go off to go loot something and it's out of the way like them having a conversation about that and saying like, yeah, my dad likes to loot sometimes. It's just, it's so much more real when you do that. When you bake the game elements into the actual elements of the game. You don't want to have three people in combat. So tier runs and hides. Like I just, it's brilliant because it all just works really nicely. The way that it all comes together. It was all broken and covered in hive stuff last time we were here. These elves use Alfheim's light to enhance the temple, and themselves by the look of it. They definitely look more dangerous than last time. Oh, those were just the foot soldiers. They'll get more dangerous the further up we go. Great. Cool. Love that. <laughs> Sure is pretty though. Gotta say. That contrast. Shrine is this way, Kratos. Yeah. You know, just like to be thorough. I see. By all means. He just likes to be thorough. Anything interesting this way? The Bifrost Bridge. I know it's not uncommon to hear the voices of those we've lost in the light, so I decided to run one little experiment, with the permission of the temple's guardian, of course. I was missing my beloved a streaker, something terrible, and thought perhaps if I could hear him one last time, I'd feel more at peace. I packed up some of his favorite things, his blanket, the stuffed tatzel worm I enchanted to squeak when squeezed, and an old drake bone with the teeth marks still imprinted. And I set them down near the light to see if I could perhaps call to his soul. I sat quietly for some time. I called to him. 
It was very difficult to confirm, but after a while, I swear I could hear the distinct sound of his paws on wood, gentle clicking from his nails, just the way they used to sound at home. They grew close, but my heart beat faster in anticipation. But as soon as the sound started, they faded and I heard no more. Perhaps I'll try again one day, but for now I will choose to believe he's found joy in the light. Needs the comforts of his old life no more. I'm glad for him. Look how cool this glittery stuff is. You kidding me? Hell yeah. These things smell awful. Yeah. Hades Retribution. Glad we explored. A forceful stab that embeds a fiery bomb which detonates after a brief delay. Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and do that, just because that looks cool. This is why we're thorough, Atreus. You get cool stuff. We have been reinforced that this is the best idea. Ooh. Hey, Tyr, let me stand on your shoulders, big guy. Come here. Daddy's got to throw an axe at a bird. Another crystal in there where I got to do like a double bounce. Let's see. God damn bird. Must have to do it without the help. Or do I have to do it where I hit him on the turn? I don't know that that's it. Oh, this is frustrating. This is frustrating. Mm, I don't want to leave. I want this bird dead. Thank you for your streams and VODs. I'm struggling a bit with my family relationships and a life. Your content makes me at ease. Thank you. It is my pleasure. Thank you for popping in here to say that. I'm glad that I could help in some kind of way. This is 
the squirrely. What is that running into? Can't you can't jump and throw. I do not want help. I will ask if I want it. Hmm. Hmm. See, this is one of those moments where I'm glad the game doesn't handhold because I have to figure it out. Shall we continue? So if these elves use the light to build doors and make themselves stronger, what do the dark elves want with it? To return it back to its source. To them, the natural resources of Alfheim are sacred. None more so than the light itself. Aye, the light elf's success came at a terrible price. Alfheim's once lively desert withered into a storm-ridden wasteland <clears throat> soon after the creation of this temple. <laughs> That's a fair few birds you've hunted. I wonder if it might be worth visiting the raven tree. Thank you for the seven months, Red Robin. Yeah, I just needed to see it. I didn't pay attention. It was a double bouncer. I just didn't see the first one. So, that works. Glad to know that that's a thing. There's more Twilight Stone up there. You're building quite the collection of poetry, brother. Why so surprised? My people are known for their culture. Not surprise. Esteem. <laughs> Love that. In which Kvasir provides readers with their own tools for crafting stories. Visions after rest lay in wait for explorers crafted by the imps and filled with music, joy, or horror. Among these fanciful realms lie endless creation and possibilities where the limit one's own imagination. That's an interesting one. I don't know that I can place that one. Spider, thank you for the 21 months. The Twilight Stone didn't give you the right angle. Are you certain? No, I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, that's where... <laughs> Ahead. I'll handle this. Uh, maybe that's not a great idea. I admire his resolve in terms of continuing to try to do this. Try it, dude. Oh, there, friends. Salutations. We mean you no harm. Here, get back. Okay. Oh, you try. Oh, he pushed him. want the souls and the light left alone but the light elves want to keep using them that's the long and short of it aye so then which side is right rarely is it so simple i'm not our place to say this is an elven conflict 
I said as much the last time we were in Alfheim. Right. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Since we haven't really had any chance to do much analysis on this episode yet, I, I will use this as a chance to talk a little bit about why Atreus would ask that question. I think it's not just a question that's specific to a teenager. I think all of us at some point might want to ask the question of who's right or who's wrong. But the binary on that, I think, is more of a reflection of our cognitive desire to have the answer to something and to have it be airtight. The human brain doesn't really do well with gray areas. It's why we don't like ethical dilemmas. It's why we want things to be just nicely defined and outlined and pointed to and everything else. When you introduce ambiguity, you introduce anxiety. Atreus asking that question of who's right is maybe a reflection of that, but can also be a potential reflection of the way that he's still trying to develop reasoning. Prefrontal cortex comes about where he can understand and appreciate that there's complexity, but he still goes in a direction of there must be one logical conclusion in the binary of right and wrong. When Tyr and, and Mimir and Kratos suggest that there is a gray area there, Atreus takes it a little bit more in stride. When Kratos says, well, I told you this last time. Yeah, you said it to a little kid who wasn't really able to get there as well as a teenager can. So even though Atreus might be asking a similar question than he might have asked when he was a child, he has more of an ability to sim like manipulate symbols and abstract concepts now as a teenager than he did as a child. And thus, it's worth revisiting the conversation now because of his change in development. And so Kratos needs to recognize as his parent that Sometimes the same conversation you had with your kid however many years ago is going to come up again. And this time there's more nuance available to you by virtue of the fact that the brain has developed. So it's a little bit of an oscillation there for Atreus where he is recognizing that this is a very complex situation. He still thinks that there might be an easy answer. He's just going to move back and forth through that as Kratos and Tyr and Mimir continue to scaffold the idea that it's not really how life works. It's a lot easier for us when things line up perfectly, but rarely do they, because complexity of existence is such that things just aren't ever going to line up in right angles. Another chest over there. How do we reach it? We cannot. Let us continue. You don't want to like take that as a challenge and say, but yes, we can, Dad. There's got to be a way. There's always a way. You always find a way, Dad. Tell me what I can or can't get to. Now who? Now who's the teenager? Me or Atreus? I'll prove you wrong. I think I'm right. Maybe. What is this? Why is that platform glowy? Ah. I love Sony Santa Monica toying with me here. Light doors. 
fortifications. Aye, none too eager to let the Dark Elves run the roost again. Indeed. I would like to get down there at some point. So I will. I don't think that's the way up to the shrine. We know. There's a chest over here. Oh, I see it now. Forgive my impatience. Oh, tricky. <laughs> we know. <laughs> oh man okay i just i love how self-aware the game is but i um i don't want to laugh at tear because i think there is actual merit to what Tyr is experiencing, and I'm going to be very clear here that I am in no way, shape, or form trying to suggest that Tyr might be autistic or on the autism spectrum, whichever way of putting that you prefer. However, there is a little bit of a window of insight into how a person with autism might process this type of endeavor if that were the case which is that we have been very clear about what our directive is and we've been explicit that our goal is to get to the top of the temple and that has been stated by Kratos and Atreus with very little interpretation to be made So Tyr is operating on that very clear and explicit directive. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. He doesn't have to read between the lines. He doesn't have to even necessarily possess the capacity for seeing social nuance in that. So when Kratos goes off the beaten path, despite the fact that Tyr knows the path to get to the top of the temple, his asking the question or pointing out that we're not going in the proper direction makes complete sense. Now, in the case of if this were the case that Tyr had autism, the neurotypical folks in the form of Kratos and Atreus might get frustrated because you look at Tyr and go, dude, we're just trying to explore the temple. Can't you see that? But that's missing the point. It's missing what's going on for that person, in this case, Tyr, who's basically saying, well, you told me exactly what we're doing, and I'm just pointing out what you're doing relative to that goal. It's just a literal interpretation of what's happening. And so the expectation that Tyr should just be able to read our minds and understand the social nuance as it relates to that is unrealistic and can actually cause a significant amount of distress for Tyr because he's like, I'm under the impression that this is what we're supposed to be doing, which would mean that Kratos and Atreus need to be very clear with him of like, hey, just so you know, we know that we're going up to the top of the temple, but we also are going to take time to explore this environment and look at some of the loot that's available to us. But we are aware that this is where we're going. Just nice, very clear, very directive. So I'm only illustrating this point because there's no possible way that I could ever diagnose somebody in a game with autism unless it was explicitly told to us that that's the case. But it's a really nice illustration of what that kind of interaction can look like when there's a person who continually keeps saying, in this case, Tyr, like, you guys aren't going the right way. We need to go this way. I don't understand why you're doing this. And we continue to expect that he's just going to understand it. And we, you like, oh my God, Tyr's being ridiculous. Maybe he's not being ridiculous. Maybe Tyr is literally processing, processing this in a literal form. And this is causing distress to him that we're going off the beaten path because he's not interpreting that nuance. This is really the complexity of like human dynamics. Whether there's a certain diagnosis, in this case, autism involved or not, people have different ways of orienting themselves to a given situation and have certain expectations and goals that they're operating off of. And when we just give people a hard time and laugh at them because they don't understand more of the like nuanced and passive stuff that happens, we're missing an opportunity to problem solve that and communicate clearly and directly about what's happening. 
it absolutely could be due to the anxiety about being in an open world. I, I don't know what the explanation is actually for why Tyr is like this literal about it. It just presents in a way that like my antenna went up of like, oh, I've seen this kind of thing before. And it's a way for us to maybe conceptualize it. Again, I am not saying that Tyr is autistic or is on the autism spectrum or is a person with autism. I'm, that is not what I'm saying. <clears throat> what I'm saying is that if he if he was or a person that would present that way, this might be what a type of interaction works with or looks like. And it's a translation to real life, which again, for those folks in the YouTube comments and otherwise is the point of my channel is to take this stuff and translate it to real life, not necessarily to only analyze this specific subject matter. There's got to be a way to get your axe behind this crate, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Atreus, I know what it is. I just had to stop and enjoy what Tyr was bringing to us. <laughs> I don't mean to speak out of turn, but the white marble wall behind that grate, perhaps your axe can reach it. Yeah, I thought so too. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. It worked. Thanks, dear. My pleasure. of Graham. <laughs> Upgrades increase the amount of rage gained, grants a burst of rage, and applies stun to nearby enemies. Bonus melee damage for short duration. Built of Graham, why not? Interesting. That's cool. Your axe marks stay in the marble. Look at that. Come on. That's not necessary at all. Come on. Strong side. Wrong movie. Back to it then. You could write your name in the axe marks if you were truly determined. You could. Also good to see you, Scott. I'm going to have to let go and then hit this at the exact right time. Oh, and I pulled out the wrong weapon. God damn it. Why not simply hold it in place? See, come on, man. I hate that. Let me figure it out, game. Let me figure it out. That's the whole fun. Let me try to hit it while it goes up, man. Excellent. Let's continue our ascent, yes? Now to be empathic to the characters and to try to headcanon this in a way that I don't get frustrated, here's how we're gonna look at this. In the same way that we looked at Atreus and his emerging development and his desire to have something to say and take a leadership role and deduce what's happening in the environment, when we look at Tyr in this case, I want to look at Tyr as somebody who is very goal-oriented, wants to get to the top of the tower, wants to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible, and believes that it's important for him to step in and give a direction so that we can facilitate that process quickly because he has something to offer. 
in real life, I think it would be appreciated that you have the collective problem solving power of basically two and a half adults. As a gamer, I want Tyr to shut the hell up so I can figure it out. your favorite of Gavassia's poems, brother? Why would I choose a favorite? Great question. Why would I choose a favorite? A Tale of Showcasing the Power of Visual Art by Kvasir. A gentle boy in his brush found kinship along the walls. His creations, playful sprites, brought joy to one and all. The town once empty, now flush with color and laughter, the boy hailed a hero, though merely a talented drafter. His mission, save his home, threatened by seas and disuse. His weapon, Imagination, blues, reds, purples, and chartreuse. I feel like I know the answer to this and it's driving me crazy. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It'll come to me. Oh, a mod token. That's neat. It's so interesting hearing different perspectives on backseating. I hate puzzles, so I'm just like, thank you whenever the characters help. Yeah, I like to figure it out. I don't like to be, I don't like having my hand held through games. It, it's not fun for me anyway what up homies I suppose I'll leave you to it beautiful example of the way in which reinforcement extinguishes behavior when we started in the temple every single time there was an engagement Tyr would approach that engagement thinking he could be diplomatic. Thinking that there was a way he could talk to the elves and that they would be willing to listen to him. And he had multiple instances where he attempted to do that and was punished in the form of the elves not speaking to him and attacking us. The first time it happened, Tyr was able to see it as a one-off and thought maybe perhaps it was the dwarves in this circumstance that make it so that he can't engage with them diplomatically. But then we had a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And eventually, when you receive repeated reinforcement, in this case in the form of punishment, it will eventually lead to extinguishing of behavior. And that's exactly what's happening here. Now we walk into this room, Tyr sees that there are elves flying toward us, and he says, well, I'll leave you to it. He doesn't even try. Even though it's, it's possible that this group of elves might have actually been willing to engage in diplomacy. But he's been conditioned operantly into no longer trying to engage with the elves because of the fact that it has not worked repeatedly over the span of the time that we've been in here. It's not particularly subtle, but it is worth pointing out because if you ever wonder why people do and don't do certain things that seem like it should be obvious that they do or don't do them, it's likely because there may be some level of conditioning that has happened that has led a person to believe in unrelated scenarios that a certain way of engaging with that scenario will or will not work. And maybe they're engaging in compensatory behaviors or maybe they're just trying to feel it out. But Tyr has absolutely been extinguished away from being diplomatic with with the elves at this point. And it'll be interesting to see what happens now if there are people that come forward that do want to be diplomatic because he may not see them that way. And they, now all of a sudden, they are working against the way they've been represented up until that point. Oops. Oops. 
Oops. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that why it's so difficult to change the dynamics of a relationship? Because you're trying to change the conditioned responses. Yes. Which is why when we're trying to walk people through new dynamics in their relationships based on their goals or whatever else, it's why we have to recondition people into healthier patterns. And that takes time. Yes, that is exactly why. It's why Atreus is sometimes nervous to speak up with Kratos. Despite the fact that Kratos has been very attentive to his development is because he has old patterns of his father telling him what to do and not necessarily being interested in what he has to say and not seeing him as an autonomous person. So when Atreus goes behind Kratos' back, that is likely the result of certain things that were conditioned through his childhood. And it's a lack of awareness on Atreus as part of his own development and his father's development. Yes, it happens all over the place in relationships. We can get to the chest now, yay. <clears throat> Mystic doesn't see us. There's twilight stone on the ground. I wonder if we could use twilight stone against them. We can continue up this way. Is it possible to consciously not let conditioning happen? Like, if you know somebody is trying to create a pattern, can you consciously reject the pattern formation? It's possible, yes. Father, Awareness of it here. can make a difference. Not always, but yes, it can. Okay. Here they come. Do what you must. Incoming. Oh boy. Well, I gotta deal with auto lock now, so that. Statue. These crystals. I've noticed them on the elves as well. Yeah. I wonder if this statue were to fall over the chasm. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, look. The foundation's weak. Father could push this over, no problem. Interesting. Oh, the crystals still make light bridges. Now the light elves wear them. Smart. Almost there. Allow me. I dare say he's beginning to enjoy the vandalism. Pretty soon he'll be laying waste to pottery. Shall we continue? It's a good proxy to violence. Like, Tyr grew up 
right, is the god of war, and he, he murdered and pillaged and, you know, all sorts of stuff, and now he's devoted his life to not being violent towards people and organic beings, but he can sure figure out a proxy for that kind of energy by destroying property. Generally, what happens when people break certain patterns, particularly profoundly impactful patterns in their life, is that they generally have to find a replacement, and a lot of times we will find a replacement that is relatively similar in process to do it, because that's how powerful equilibrium slash homeostasis is in our lives. So he probably is getting some level of enjoyment or fulfillment or some kind of reinforcement when he breaks the property because it's something that he was used to for a long period of time, but it also reinforces his new narrative that he's not going to be a violent person toward other people. Well, at least we're getting closer. Look up. See? Feels even taller on the inside. Can't believe all this was down here. It's pretty ridiculous. Big plot going on here. All right, time to ring the bells. I'm guessing there's a bell in here that I gotta hit with this. Yep. Atreus, please. Thank you. And let's find. Oh, well, let's open this up. Good. Okay. Third Look, one. Over there. Third one's up there. Okay. Um. So if we go boom, bing, bang, boom here. Nice. Behind you! Watch out! Not even hard. <laughs> Here, buddy. Go open that chest, huh? Horn of Blood Mead. Collected one of three horns of blood mead. Cool. Mmm. Let's see. Do we mess this thing up by shooting all this twilight stuff? Let's find out. After we kill this raven. Brighter than I remember. <laughs>
Damn the light door. There's some twilight stone on that statue shield. But that angle isn't gonna work. Do you think there's any way to stop the elves from fighting each other? Had Freyr not abandoned the realm, a lasting peace may have formed. But now... Can we really place all the blame on Freyr? This war started long before his arrival. But he had the power to heal this land and end the war, did he not? He made his choice. The wrong one. For Alfheim, perhaps. But not necessarily for him. Well, I suppose we're all entitled to walk our own paths. Regardless of where they end. Uh, pretty significant difference in morality structure. Everybody entitled to walk their own path if that path is to the detriment of the masses? <laughs> Mimir can be a bit Socratic sometimes in a way that is fine for thought experiments, but... Father, there. I... <laughs> Exercise patience, though. It's awesome that you figured that out, Atreus. I'm super proud of you, buddy, for figuring out and deducing what we need to do. Super awesome that you always are so ready to help Daddy out when you know exactly where it is that we should do and where we should go. Really admire that about you, bud, that you learn to use your voice in a, in a really profound way. Even when other people are perfectly capable of figuring things out, you're still willing to help. It's really awesome. And people will never get annoyed by that. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay, there is a thing that I can chuck my axe at. I thought so. Statue keeps getting stuck on the wing. I, yeah, I know. I gotta figure out. Daddy's gotta figure out how to get his axe in there. Okay. That looks right. Does it look right? The last time we were here, we killed the Dark Elf King. That's unfortunate. I'd wondered what became of Sparky Offer. We had to defend ourselves, but when he died, he told us we helped the wrong side. I see. Fine job, brother. This way. We're almost there. Okay. Do you still hear something wounded out there, Atreus? I think so. It could just be the storm. Perhaps we can investigate once we've uncovered a mysterious seer's hidden prophecy. Hmm. As we climb these stairs, I just want to say thanks for being here. For watching this on YouTube, thanks for taking the time. I'm glad you made it this far. I know there hasn't been as much analysis in this episode, but I am grateful to have you here. And those of you that are here live with me on Twitch, thanks for stopping by and hanging out, chatting, lurking, however it is that you hang out. Always grateful for the support of my content. And uh, y'all are fabulous. This community's great. I love that it continues to grow. And... This has been a blast. I look forward to every single episode of this game. I enjoy the... I absolutely enjoy it. Been fantastic.
Ooh, this is neat. There, the central chamber will bring us to the top. Once we find our way past yet another light door. Okay, the crystal's up top. Yeah. Facing the wrong way. Oh no. How will we ever fix it? Oh jeez. I sure hope there's a way. Allow me to speed this up. Oh, the angle should work, Kratos. Okay. Well done. At your service. Hmm. Now I want to know what I did that for. Ah, oh, the light of Alfheim. How stunning. <laughs> oh no, did I screw myself over by chopping that? No way. No way they would do that to me. I refuse to believe they would do that to me. Nothing. What's wrong? I could hear Mother inside last time, but I can't anymore. Her soul is one with the light now, united by forces older than Odin himself. She is at peace, Atreus. I hope so. When Father went inside the light, he said You went he... inside the light of Alfheim? Yes. And yet here you stand, of sound mind and decidedly not incinerated. You must tell me, Kratos, what did you see? That memory is for me alone. But I felt only moments pass. Didn't feel like moments to me. I was trapped. Atreus overcame great odds to save me. One could but only imagine. Well then, Groa's triptych awaits. I'm real proud of my son. He's big and strong, and he saved me at a time of vulnerability, is basically what that is. And I would hope that Atreus, having been around his father for as long as he's been, would register that what Kratos just said was a big deal. Kratos literally just told a fellow giant former god of war that I was in great peril and my son busted his ass to get me out of it that is that is pride that is you know could he look at Atreus and say I'm proud of you son that was awesome thanks for doing that he could but Atreus registering that and reading it is something that would be really important to Internalize. Uh, you will know if I want an answer to a question about something that's backseating. Like, you will know if I want you to backseat. If I don't explicitly say, okay, chat, tell me exactly how to do this, just assume I don't want to know. I'll live with it. Um, oh, is Tyr not a giant? I thought he was, but maybe I misread that. Uh, regardless, so, still a big deal. Did you ever meet Groa? Many times. But she was plagued by constant visions, so conversation was difficult, to say the least.
father, she's... She's gone. Yes. Keep moving. We're almost there. There have been few times in video games where I've ever seen that much emotion conveyed on the face of a character. That was like, damn. Um, the only real analysis I have for that moment is that I appreciate Atreus using his observation of his father's process to interact with his father in a way that was necessary in that moment. Which was to be direct. And to be very clear about the reality of the situation. He knew that, like, Kratos doesn't get distracted by much of anything. Really the only thing he ever gets distracted by other than loot is Faye remembrance of her stuff like this etc so atreus already knows that the only way his father would get sidetracked like this would be if he heard something it may also indicate to us that perhaps atreus heard it too and atreus might have far less emotional investment in his mother than kratos does because kratos had so much more time invested and she was his intimate partner so it may be that Atreus is able to access some level of distance from that if he heard it. I don't know if he did, but regardless, he walks up to his father, he touches him, and pulls his hand down, says, what are you doing? And then says, she's gone. That is exactly what he needs to do because it's exactly what Kratos needs in order to snap back to reality. He's sort of questioning himself as he's walking away from that, being like, did I really hear that shit? That's crazy. But Atreus' directness there was reaching and meeting Kratos at his process and how he handles things. And it was beautiful. The, the way that Kratos basically trusts Atreus there with that and realizes that he's telling the truth. And that reality is the thing he needs to pay attention to and it brings him back and he walks away. Really, really nice moment of understanding between Atreus, his son, who has observed his father a lot. And... Kratos, who is struggling in that moment. Is this the same Dr. Mick from Spotify? I had no idea he streamed too. That's why. Wait a second. Are you really telling me that you found me on Spotify first? Spicy Cheesecake, I want you to know that if that's the case, you are probably the first person that has ever come in here and explicitly said they found me on Spotify first and then discovered that I'm a streamer. That is a mind-blowing moment for me. <laughs> huh. They've changed some stuff. Last time, there was all this Hive stuff up here. So many Dark Elves. I... All this time, I thought the Dark Elf King... I thought all the Dark Elves were... Dear? Yes? Did we help the wrong side? Hmm. Are you certain that's the right question? I... What's the right question? Is there a right side? Exactly. What do you think, Atreus? Is there a right side in this war? I... I don't know. Then perhaps you shouldn't pick one. Come on! This game's just lobbing this shit up for me. Softballs. Just throwing me softballs. Are you kidding me? You want to talk about how you scaffold formal operational thought? That's it. Right there. That's how you do it. You, you reach in to the lower level of development 
you recognize the choice and the thing that Atreus is in. And then you ask questions in a very non-challenging way to get him to engage in additional thought and complexity around that thing. And then when he has to experience some of the cognitive dissonance there, you ask him to draw a conclusion based on that data. And he has to acknowledge that he doesn't know. And then you drive the point home. Instead of expecting that Atreus would automatically understand all of that, Kratos and Tyr, as two people who do understand that, literally just brought him through a little mini burst of development that allows him to get into this idea that we don't just work concretely in life. There are abstract concepts and symbols and dynamics that come into play and that we don't always need to insert ourselves in those things, particularly if we don't have enough information. That was a beautiful way of scaffolding him into something that Kratos used to go at him directly with and he didn't fully understand, which is the idea that you can't just go in guns blazing and you can't only work with unknown variables. You got to work with the knowns. And if you don't know enough, you stay out of it. That was perfect. That is how you scaffold a teenager through formal operational thought. Chef's freaking kiss, man. Mm, especially to have the tandem of Tyr and Kratos. Kr like, think about even that. Kratos is willing to defer that out to Tyr. Which I think he probably learned from the fact that he's picked things up from Amir. But he deferred that out to Tyr. So not, it wasn't even just about the intensity of my dad thinks he knows more than me. He brought in an outside reference to sort of back that up and warmly move Atreus through that. That's incredible. It's just so tactful, and it's just so well done. Mm. I am all about it. I am all about that. That is so good. You gotta be kidding. Your songs came up on the radio that plays after a similar playlist is over. That's how I initially found you. That is wild. Very cool that you decided to pop over here. <laughs> oh. I just... Mm, this is like... Mm, this is so juicy, man. This is the stuff I get excited about and geek out about. This is why I got a PhD in human development right here. Oh, man. Is that good? <laughs> Ale rune, thank you for the raid. Appreciate that a lot. I hope you had a great stream. Can't drop down there yet. Or so it would seem. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Right. I'm all right with that. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I kind of remember this place now from 2018. Now it looks familiar. Yep. All right. Come on. How lazy can you be, Sony Santa Monica, reusing assets from God of War 2018? My God, put a little effort into your game. What is this, the library from Halo Combat Evolved? Obviously. 
reuse whatever assets you want. They're amazing. It's actually kind of cool to come back here. Oh, there they are. Thanks for grabbing this. <laughs> You're using Kratos? <laughs> Make an original character, Sony. Yeah. <laughs> Do you believe in fate, Sindri? Oh, of course not. You think I'd wash my hands this much if I thought that what I do doesn't ultimately matter? There's only one thing with any say over how we live our lives, and that's us. Hey, Sindri, wasn't your forge on the other side of the shrine last time? My, someone's got an eye for detail. Perhaps the Light Elves felt it looked better on this side. They do have a thing for aesthetics. Honestly, I'm as puzzled as you are. But it's best not to look a gift forge in the two-year. <laughs> Very messy. <laughs> anyway, good luck! <laughs> oh my god, the writing is so good. I tend to not be a particular fan of the idea of fate only because fate is a way that people defer accountability for making choices in the here and now. I actually really like that Sindri is willing to say that like the only thing that we really know to be true and what we can control is what we do here and now. A great way to look at things because usually when people start engaging in certain behaviors that are unsavory as it relates to the environment and the people in them and they say well it's fate that this is the case you're really just you're, you're not allowing yourself to take that sense of control and accountability for the things that you do and that's not a particularly fruitful way to navigate your existence it's okay to screw things up it's okay to be wrong sometimes like it's okay to work sometimes with not enough information because you simply don't have access to it if you just chalk everything up to fate then you're just riding along on the roller coaster of life and passive rolling around on life i for some people works but if you want if you're a person that wants to have a sense of control agency wants to reduce the anxiety of not knowing what's coming next or whatever like get into the idea that you can influence the future through how you engage in the present which i know we talked about in the previous episode you analyze everyday things when you're walking with your friends or like are you just in these cutscenes? <laughs> this is the point of why I stream is to overanalyze these games in the hope that some of this translates to real life so people can learn something about themselves or certain concepts that may be of interest to them. No, I'm not like this when I'm talking to my friends. I can be if they want me to be, but no, I'm not. That's not how I work through my life. All right, Spalders of Enlightenment. Ooh, those look badass. I'm not gonna wear them though. Wrist armor, bracers of enlightenment. Also look badass. These are cool, but I don't want them. So, did you um disinfect these? It's fine. I'll do it. Um, uh, Blades of Chaos. There, how the pommel's looking, good shield. May it strike true. Okay. Good. Chest armor. Can I I don't have any dwarven stain dwarven steel to get these up. Alright, well. All right. 
Keep it rolling. The Giants always did enjoy hiding their secrets in plain sight. Wait until you see this. Yes. Here we have Drua's search for her missing husband. She was relentless in her attempt to find him. Meditated for weeks on end. Unfortunately, she found... something else. A vision of Ragnarok. Word of Groa's vision reached Odin. He sought her out. Demanded a private retelling. Didn't like what he heard, apparently. Ironwood? That's the... I don't know what that is. The mythical sanctuary for giants. Curious. So it's in Jotunheim? I know some giants thought so, but Ironwood isn't anywhere, lad. It's a concept, a metaphorical paradise. It's not real. Presumably, Groa requested her ashes be returned to Jotunheim, while her soul found peace in the light. Difficult to imagine Odin respecting those wishes. It wouldn't surprise me if Atreus's acknowledgement that he doesn't actually know what Ironwood is, is in part in the wake of what happened in the room prior to this one, when Kratos and Tyr supported the idea that it's okay to not know the answer to something. It's not a... He doesn't need to take the role of know-it-all. It's not going to impress Kratos or Tyr for him to try to be a hero and wing it and draw a random conclusion so that he looks like he's smart. His acknowledgement that he doesn't know is powerful. One of the greatest indicators of a person's intellect is their willingness and ability to recognize the things that they don't know rather than always try to act as if they know everything. I don't trust anybody who says they know everything. I trust people who can acknowledge their limitations and say, I don't know. And that is, process that happened I think was a way to create a sense in Atreus that it's okay to say what he doesn't know and it's not going to ruin everything and people aren't going to be disappointed in him hmm. the champion I think it's supposed to be me you assume too much I best not to read into these abstractions so literally prophecies are slippery by nature although some are more obvious than others. Ragnarok. Aye. The end of everything. So this is it. There's nothing we can do to stop it. There must be a way. Why else is this hidden? Look. Here. This is what we saw. It's you. Fighting in Ragnarok. No. I don't... I can't. What's this then? That's new. Asgard is destroyed? But the other realms thrive? She did. <laughs> Odin's working off a false prophecy. <laughs> so then, we can win Ragnarok. We can beat Odin. We are not present in any of this. But that was Tyr leading the charge against Asgard. Plus, Hell's army was there, and the elves. Champion. Okay, whoever that is doesn't matter. <laughs> but for the first time. We know something Odin doesn't. We just saw we can win. Tyr? I won't allow prophecy to define my choices. But, but we just saw no, you. No, Atreus. This is wrong. Come. There. 
there is much to discuss. Here's time. We can't stop Ragnarok, but we can win it. Just spitballing here. Perhaps there is a chance that that was not Tyr, but is instead Atreus. Just saying. Maybe. I don't know. Never played the game. Blind run. Something tells me that that may not necessarily be Tyr. Who knows? We'll find out. But Atreus has shown his cards here. Understandably so. Atreus wants to matter. He wants to have influence. He has seen his father. He has heard about his mother inspire people. And lead and fight and and matter to others he owes to some extent his existence to the fact that people have fought so there's this immense idea that because of who he is he's supposed to have a role in all this and the idea that Ragnarok is inevitable is something that full runs completely dissonant to Atreus's emerging sense of identity that he's supposed to be somebody who can help and somebody who matters He's desperate for this to work out, and he's looking for all the different ways that this conclusion that he's drawing or this thing that he's seeing fuels that story. Now, nobody outright said that this is wrong. Like, I mean, the fact that Mimir was willing to be like, oh, shit, we know something that Odin doesn't, I think is pretty significant given the fact that Mimir tends to be pretty damn good at deducing what's going on in the world as the smartest man alive. But boy, howdy, is he going to run up a bunch of, uh, against a bunch of complexity here because we're going to see an intersection of conflicting doctrine straight up. We're seeing firsthand that there really is a dichotomy as it relates to the idea of prophecy, which is, are prophecies actually true? Is the future foretold? Or do we have influence and we don't have to follow a prophecy? Or perhaps is there a backdoor way that the, that the prophecy ends up working because you tried to go against whatever it was. And nobody necessarily knows the answer to that question. As Mamir even said, prophecies are slippery, which means they're not necessarily airtight. Perhaps they're just an idea of what's possible. But now you're going to get into different value judgments that each character has as it relates to this concept of prophecy in and of itself. And how are we going to see people exert autonomy against it? It seems to me like all three people involved here have some degree of desire to exert autonomy against it. Tyr wants to do whatever is the opposite so that he can feel like he's in control. Atreus wants to fight it because he feels like that's the way that he can exert influence. And Kratos wants to run away from it and hide. But I think Kratos is recognizing that like, oh shit, maybe we are going to have to do something about this, and this is stirring up a whole bunch of shit from my past where I tried to influence the events by killing gods and destroying Greece and all this other shit. Oh god, I gotta do this again. But everybody's coming at this from an entirely different angle, and I can just feel this immense amount of tension building because everybody now is being held accountable to their narratives and their values as it relates to what's going on in the world. But I don't know necessarily that that has to be Tyr that's involved in that prophecy. It's not clearly, it didn't, there was no label on top of it that said, this is Tyr. And when Kratos says we have much to discuss, it, there's a sense here that there's something that's known. And I would be curious if Kratos potentially says, like, we don't know that that's Tyr, that might be you, buddy. But I don't know that he wants Atreus to know that because his teenage brain can't handle that, if that's true. Teenage brain's going to explode. He's going to think he's going to need to do something right now instead of really thinking about it more in a nuanced way because that's the ultimate confirmation of what it is that he believes. Again, I have no idea if that's Atreus. I could be completely off base. Maybe it is Tyr. But what's amazing about this, 
and staring at this prophecy and watching the way that they react to it is that we all have to sit in the same uncertainty that they do. This stirs anxiety. We don't know what's true. We don't know what isn't. We don't know what we can influence. We don't know what is inevitable. And so every single one of them is having to navigate all the dissonance, all the uncertainty, all the anxiety that comes along with that. So we're going to learn a lot about them through the way they orient themselves to this as they process it going forward. Could that be another example of how teenagers often view things in an egocentric way? Atreus sees a prophecy about a young champion and says it must be me. Yeah, I would say that that's totally fair. Yeah, Tyr is unhappy with the revelation because he's feeling a sense of his autonomy being stripped, which I think would be particularly more salient to him given the fact that he was imprisoned for however many number of years and finally now has some ability to influence the environment. <laughs> See, the thing about Tyr that I think is happening for him is Tyr, my guess, believes that whenever he is resorting to violence, he is out of control. He is expected to engage in violence by being the, a god of war, his entire life was built and predicated upon the idea that he was violent. So I think part of the reason that he is so averse to being violent now is because that is a way for him to exert autonomy against those forces. It's a way for him to say, I'm in control when I'm going full pacifist here. So when there's a prophecy in front of him that suggests that maybe it's him that has to fight this and go back into violence, he looks at that and says, what the hell? I'm essentially back in prison now. I went from one prison to another to another. I'm doomed to have to be violent here. Come on, man. I don't want that. I want to have control over my life and my behaviors and my values and my narratives. And this is bullshit. So he's going to polarize against that as an act of autonomy. Whereas Atreus potentially is engaging in a sense of autonomy because he's being presented with the idea that he could influence a world that really up until this point he hasn't had much influence on by virtue of the fact that he's a kid. Like the thing is, humans generally like to feel like they are in control of what they're doing at the very least with their own body. And when you strip people of that sense of autonomy and control of their environment, it can be a pretty unsettling thing and you will often see people overcompensate for that sometimes dramatically and sometimes to the detriment of others so this becomes an incredibly complex discussion here about what this means for all of them going forward as they push through this because even kratos i think probably to an extent sees shifting his role to being one of protector of his son as something that he gets to choose to do instead of something that he was destined to do it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing moment here that we just witnessed and is incredibly complex in the sense that we now have three different trains of thought potentially that are going to go into something that they have to decide whether it's true or not with a bunch of unknown variables. This is almost like a pseudo known variable because it's a prophecy. We can't guarantee that it's the lay of the land and that it's the law, but we also don't know that it's untrue. That's a pretty pretty tricky situation for anybody to be. This is going to be the spot where I end part seven. Feels like a pretty good spot to end, and I have to go, unfortunately. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this. If you are watching this on YouTube, thank you so much. Make sure you leave a like on this, and make sure you leave a comment down below if there's anything you want to say about the playthrough. I read all the comments. I don't respond to all of them but I do read them. So thank you for those of you that do leave comments. Share this with people that you think could benefit from it and would enjoy it. Uh, Noble, thank you very much for the subscription, by the way. Those of you that are members on YouTube, thanks for your financial support of the stream. Make sure you follow all the links in the description. Come check us out on Twitch sometime. If you're binging this series and you're ready to go right into the next one, I'll see you in part eight. If you're waiting for the next one, I'll get it out as soon as I can. But more than anything, I appreciate your presence. I appreciate your support of my content, and I will do it for as long as you'll have it. So I'll catch you in part eight, friends.